I'm, I'm Jean Caroon. I'm a principal at Goody Clancy, a Boston-based architecture firm, and I want to welcome everybody to the Boston Society for Architecture, Matter and Opinion, Existing Buildings. Uh, this is the next to the last series uh, session in a series on climate action and building the will to reuse existing buildings. As I said, I'm Jean Caroon. I'm a principal at Goody Clancy. I'm very happy to be moderating this session which will be about um, housing and uh, with a stellar uh, panel and we're, we're looking forward to your questions from the audience. We'll be focusing on multifamily housing today. We invite you to join us for our very last session next week, which will be on Monday. And uh, we'll be looking at higher education facilities on Monday. But I would like to thank our sponsor, Spalding Brick Company, who has made this session possible. Uh, and all of the sessions this summer, we really appreciate uh, their stepping up to the plate to make such an important topic uh, available to, to all. I'd also like to thank our partners, uh, the various AIA chapters, the AIA Central Massachusetts, who are hosting the New England Design Awards this year, AIA Connecticut, Rhode Island, Vermont, Western Massachusetts, and the Boston Preservation Alliance, Built Environment Plus, and the Boston chapter of the International Facility for Management Association. Uh, just a reminder that we are recording this session and that your registration and attendance includes your consent to the BSA image and content release policy. We will share this session later this week for you to access on architects.org and we'll notify you by email once it's posted. If you'd like to receive continuing education credit or a certificate for attending today, uh, please fill out the short Google form. The link will uh, occur in the chat. Uh, so look for it there. Uh, our wonderful Caitlin Hart, who's been the key organizer for this session and keeps us all going, will post it at least twice, I know from experience. So uh, please look for it at that point. This session and the series have been about building the will around existing buildings among many constituents uh, by investigating the hurdles to and benefits of existing building works. In doing this, we can determine what we need as owners, builders, architects, and advocates to embrace existing buildings as many things, but especially as climate solutions at a time when the urgency of climate change is, is paramount and getting more and more press. We know that reusing what already exists is the fastest way uh, to meet our, our carbon reduction goals. And that's what these sessions are all about. Uh, today, we'll learn about two multifamily housing projects uh, in, located in Somerville and Lawrence. Uh, following presentations on each of the projects, we'll open it up for discussion and Q&A. Uh, we really appreciate it if you have questions that you go ahead and post them in the chat, but we, you can also just uh, bring them up after the sessions are done. Uh, first today we'll hear from Bethany Moody, a project architect at Icon Architecture, and Dan Drazine, Vice President of Development at Trinity Financial, and Lawrence Sparrow, the Construction Project Manager at Trinity Financial. And then we'll hear from Frank, Frank Valdez, principal at Demilla Schaefer, Brian Langton, uh, director of modernization at Somerville Housing Authority. And uh, with that, let's begin. Hi, everyone. I will get us started here. Okay, so we are going to kick it off, Trinity Financial and Icon Architecture to speak about Arlington Point. Dan, I'm gonna hand it over to you first. All right, hello everybody. Um, I hope everyone's staying cool on this, this hot August day. Um, I wanted to take a minute to tell you a little bit about Trinity and, and provide some background and context about this project uh, that we undertook in Lawrence called Arlington Point. Um, so Trinity Financial is a 34-year-old Boston-based real estate development firm. <clears throat> We've done more than 35 projects uh, across our history and 
Our focus is really housing. We've done over 8,000 units of multifamily housing. We, we do incorporate commercial components into some of our work, but it's always part of a, of a, of a residential um, project initially, and we, we might fold in a commercial or retail space. Um, but our work is really broken into three buckets. Um, we do public housing, a revitalization work. We do um, high-end luxury market rate housing. And then we also do mixed income residential work, which including historic uh, rehab and adaptive reuse projects. And this Arlington Point project fits into that last bucket, which um, I'll touch, which we'll be diving into today. So, so do you hear just a couple of representative images of those three buckets I was describing? Um, on the left, our, our market rate project in downtown Stanford, Connecticut, um, 66 Summer Street, um, at the top of the screen on the right is a public housing revitalization project in East Boston, which has um, pretty stunning views of uh, downtown Boston uh, right across the harbor. And uh, the, the last project, which is probably the most similar to this Arlington Point project we'll be describing today, is, a, is our 60 King project in Providence, Rhode Island, um, which was another adaptive reuse of a historic mill building in, a, in the old Imperial Knife Company factory in Providence. I'll just give a quick summary here. So Icon Architecture, partnering with Trinity, is an award-winning design firm and leader in alternative construction methods. We're becoming increasingly known for our leadership in sustainability, passive house design, and definitely for our work with existing buildings. We work primarily in the Northeast, range of project types from multifamily housing, mixed use, higher ed, occupied sites, and building renewal. Our Renew Studio has a history of transforming existing buildings as part of our take on modern preservation. It's the transformation of buildings to preserve existing resources for resiliency, preserve community, preserve affordable housing, all while preserving the historic fabric. Back over to you, Dan. Uh, great, thanks, Bethany. So I, I think the... Um... The real magic of these historic buildings is really tied up in the history of these of these buildings and the complexes in which they are located. So I just want to take a quick minute to talk about um, what is known as the Arlington Mills Historic District and the Arlington Mills Complex, um, because I think the history is fascinating and it really it really adds some color and some life to these projects. <clears throat> so this Arlington Mills Complex um, sits on the Lawrence Methuen line and um, it was, at the time, it was one of the most uh, technologically advanced mill complexes uh, in the country. And it was attractive because it was right next to the Boston and Maine Railroad line, which ran um, just on the other side of the pond you see in this picture on the left. Um, but it was really an industrial powerhouse, uh, much like the mills um, that we all know in, in Lowell, which is largely considered the, the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. Um, they had 7,000 workers at this complex at its height, and it even had its own hospital. Um, and I think these pictures just kind of give you a sense for how vast uh, and really how massive these mill complexes were and just how um, industrious they were. Um, and just the volume of, of textiles that they churned out was, was really stunning. So we're going to skip ahead um, to 1985. Um, the mill complex um, did run into um, the similar dynamics we saw across the Northeast, where um, product production shifted to the South or overseas, and the complex fell into decline. But in 1985, um, with <clears throat> local congressional leadership, um, it, there was a National Historic District established here. Uh, it's a 75 acre district which straddles Lawrence and Methuen. So that was a, a great um, step forward for the complex. Arlington Point is right on the water. Um, the 608 Broadway project, which Larry and Bethany will touch on, um, it just sits next to, to Arlington Point. So unfortunately, um, <clears throat> the fire that struck this complex in 1995 is um, one reason that a lot of folks know about this complex. Um, Arlington Mills was home to the Polar Tech Company, which produced fleece. Um, and in 1995, a fire tore through the complex and 
just decimated three buildings that had to be torn down. Um, the, the, the beautiful story that came out of this was actually um, the owner of Polar Tech continued to pay his workers um, while he was rebuilding the complex. And he, he, became, <clears throat> he became lionized in the press for, for doing that. And really, um, um, that, that's a really nice part of the story. So we continue on past 1995 into 2008, when the city establishes a 40-hour smart growth overlay district. And this was really the first attempt to um, catalyze development in this area um, after the establishment of the historic district. So the, the, the 40-hour smart growth district is, is 34 acres. So it's a little bit smaller than the historic district, um, but it allows for residential as of right. Um, and it's zoned for up to a thousand units of housing. So that's a, a pretty cool um, framework and, and, and help to incentivize developers to begin to redevelop these complexes, these buildings. So that brings us up to today. Um, so <clears throat> WIN development, W-I-N-N, -N, not W-Y-N-N, um, did the Law 550 project um, uh, about seven years ago. And that was the first residential redevelopment project right on Broadway. <clears throat> the subject of today's discussion includes the Arlington Point project, which is in the foreground of this picture. That was 102 units. And then our next project, which we're hoping to get started on this fall, is the 608 Broadway project in the Mariner Mill building right next door. So um, hopefully that gives everyone a nice backdrop for, for where we're, for the area in which we're, we're, we're working here. So why did Trinity do this project? Um, as, um, as Jean mentioned at the top of the, the, the opening here, we don't see anything more green than adaptive reuse and, and breathing new life into these, these historic buildings. Um, the 40R smart growth overlay district was attractive because we didn't need any zoning relief. Um, we, were, we, we had to get planning board approval and conservation commission approval, but there was no um, zoning change, there was no uh, city council approval needed. Um, and also, obviously, given the vintage of these buildings, we could use federal and state historic tax credits. Um, so those, from a finance perspective, that was, that was attractive. And then finally, um, Lawrence has seen a real surge in its population, but the housing development has not kept pace. So there's an overwhelming need for additional housing in the city. And with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Bethany and Larry. Yeah, thanks, Dan. So here's just kind of an overview of those buildings we're talking about. And I think we're gonna dive in deeper and Larry chime in as you feel too. But really, I think the full team was behind this project mission of creating an active residential community, transforming this historic asset into rental housing for low and extremely low income families and workforce and people with disabilities. And we had a real focus on the healthy, healthy living building for the residents and providing community spaces and amenities that would enable residents to have an enhanced social experience. And I'll touch on the design team's charge. So again, to reiterate, we're really focused on these sort of preservation goals that we view as modern preservation. So affordable housing preservation, what is this? It's critical for the success of this project to support young professionals and working families that are trying to stay and grow and thrive in Lawrence. We want to preserve the sense of place, which is prioritizing protecting the historic fabric, these exposed materials, the massive volumes of space, the unique character defining elements that are so special to Arlington Point, and then preserving it as a community anchor. Just thinking of everything that this building has gone through, Dan highlighted a lot of its history all the workers and families it's served, people have grown up with these buildings and it's really an identity for the city of Lawrence. And also the idea of preserving existing resources. We really wanted to embrace the happy accident that existing buildings are inherently the greenest buildings. We're already starting off on the right foot that this mill is uh, reducing the amount of demo waste and new materials that would go into building a new building on this site. So really, let's keep this going. What's the healthiest and most responsible design decisions we can make? This is all part of ICON's sensible green focus, which is just 
simple, sustainable, durable design choices for healthy living. And I will give us um, a quick walkthrough of the site uh, before Larry jumps into some of the opportunities and discoveries. Uh, so this is the site. We've got the Van Brody main warehouse mill um, located along the Spicket River and Stevens Pond, which is actually the original mill pond that supplied water for the complex. It's a complete restoration of these three buildings, the warehouse, the uh, original incinerator building, and then the existing pump house, which is still in service. So once an anchor for this community, it's been standing vacant. Now we can work with Mass Historic and National Park Service to sensitively adapt uh, these buildings into 102 units of mixed income family housing. And just a quick look at the existing building plan. We've already got uh, all of this structure in place. We have the existing masonry in place. The columns are really going to be everything directing the entire layout for the building. Uh, we have a regular eight foot uh, column spacing, column bay. Um, the infrastructure is already on site. Roads are already nearby. Um, and so really, where do we start? Uh, we start laying out this building, trying to prioritize the historic entry it's really celebrated with this vertical expression on the building. Obviously, we have to make the responsible decision to make it accessible and equitable for all. But that brings us to today. Um, we have these large loft style units in a clean modular two to three bay footprint. They're luxurious open plan living for affordable housing clients and we don't have to sacrifice on amenity spaces. You can see in this wing of the building here, looking over Stevens Pond, that we have a sunny lounge, focusing on those views across the water, a fitness center, and a kids center that's critical for the families living here. I'm gonna hand it over to you, Larry. Oh, well, thank you very much, Bethany. <clears throat> I'm Larry Sparrow with Trinity. Um, I oversaw the construction of this, both pre-construction and all the pricing. Uh, we had a nice construction team um, along with ICON, we had Abatha was our contractor, who we've done a couple of historic rehabs with them uh, previously. Um, so it was a real nice fit, along with all the various engineers, geotech, etc. Um, so you can see um, in previous sides that this building, uh, although it was good and solid, it certainly needed a lot of help. So as we manage the construction and the funds, um, we always have contingencies. Um, I kept in abeyance um, certain amounts until we know we got through the found, what I call foundations or the main demo, structural repairs, et cetera. And we did that reasonably comfortably within our budgets, which the biggest thing then I released was a hundred percent cut and point of all the masonry. So in my opinion, I don't know if you go to the next slide, if it shows it a little more, but um, the building went from looking like an old tired masonry building to frankly, a brand new building, uh, which can be done with uh, good cleaning, historic cleaning. You know, you, you do the analysis, chemical analysis, et cetera, of, the, um, of all the mortars and replacement of brick. We happen to use Judy Selwyn, who which probably most folks know over the many years um, and we worked together and I think came up with, uh, th that was money well spent, well over a half a million dollars additional from just the spot pointing we had. Um, but boy, that makes it made a nice difference. And then a favorite uh, joke with <laughs> our, our group is that uh, for some reason we couldn't find a home for the transformer except right next to the front door. So we, uh, myself- Need to uh, keep an eye on it. <laughs> <laughs> along with our landscape architects, myself coming and tickling around ideas. And we came up with something that was semi-transparent, but a, a little interest. So that was, uh, that was a fun thing to do, which maybe we'll see others, other components of that. We, we uh, try to instill uh, a certain delight in our, in our renovations when we can afford it. Yeah, and we should talk about some of the, tell the story about some of the old site features. Yeah, we had, um, well, we were able to add the PV panels that we all know is also a, uh, a good thing to do when budget allows and which we were able to. 
Um, you can see in this middle slide that uh, during after that fire, uh, Polatech and the new building, when the new buildings were built, he also expanded into uh, the old buildings. And there was a lot of temp piping strung off from building to building. And they built these racks and we actually went across the bridge. Um, and so we cleaned all that up, but just left the main structural component that you see painted in dark green. And we added some nice uh, lighting to it. Um, and that was a delight. And then that, <laughs> That yeah. elevator penthouse on, um, which was caught, which was the incinerator building. Although I never totally, there was a, a chimney next to the building, but it was called the incinerator building. And frankly, I'm a preservationist, but I didn't see the need for that top <laughs> aspect of this small building. But historic insisted on it, so we spent some extra money and really fixed it up. And and, and Bethany came up with the cladding of the metal siding and stuff, and it it came out nice. <laughs> <laughs> and then on the insides, working with uh, the Icon interiors, um, uh, we, we, I try to be cautious throughout the main parts of the building, but I tried to say, you know, let's be playful in areas. So we came up with some nice lighting and uh, as you can see, um, a, a place for uh, um, working on, on the, um, yeah, I'm forgetting the name of it, the wood, it isn't wood flooring, it's a vinyl plank flooring, mm -hmm. but you know, doing areas of moderation of spending a little extra money. We also hung some of the old fire doors um, as, a, as an expression of some of the historic elements in the building. Yeah, and this plays to some unique branding that I think we liked to latch on to as well with playing up the textile history, choosing a chevron pattern in the flooring. Um, these pendant fixtures were kind of a, a special indulgence that, you know, it's a giant volume of space but now this gives us a little bit of a human element getting to drop those pendants into the space. They're also uh, actually felt fins. So it's another kind of fabric element that also had an acoustic property to help soften the space as well. It's a lot of hard masonry. So a lot of playful elements that we had fun with. Mm -hmm. And then I think we all know that people who have worked with historic buildings, um, you end up with tremendous interior spaces. They tend to be higher ceilings, uh, the depth of the units, what you can do with these units is just uh, delightful uh, that we can't ever seem to work into new construction. Um, and so these are just some examples of some of the interiors. Yeah, and I think um, this is something that, you know, Larry and I bounce around a, a lot trying to we really have to study the design solutions holistically, something that's compatible with the existing building, but we still have to meet appropriate codes and separations for uh, multifamily housing. So whether it's taking a deeper look at what our floor and ceiling assemblies are, prioritizing what's going to be exposed as part of the historic fabric uh, versus what is going to be a built up assembly for fire separation and acoustic separation, um, we're learning a lot about best practice for getting our uh, demising walls and that continuous seal against uh, a non-perfect condition at the existing masonry wall. So it's something that we're um, continuing to understand and perfect as in all of our projects, really. And then there was the, uh, the pond, Steven's pond that, um, was a challenge. Uh, you can see the existing of it that um, I had a little budget allowance set aside with the contractor. We really weren't sure what we we're gonna end up with um, by the time we got all the trees and the fencing, old fencing, dilapidation down, what we were gonna be left with. And um, it all turned out well. And in part of it was uh, I had a nice collaboration with the foreman Masterson's foreman, who was the site contractor, he and I worked together to develop in the middle of the rehab. You can see one area that was really falling apart and we were able to simply get some concrete blocks to make it work. Um, and then I went, I think it was in Woburn, I got a whole bunch of old uh, granite curbing that we laid on the flat, you can see in the small photo, and then we put our fence on top of that. And I, I put that all around the property edge, all the way across. And that just cleaned up that whole existing wall edge. And gosh darn it, it came out pretty nice. 
It, it really reinforced that relationship for the new users with the river. It was always important to have that connection, but now with all the addition of these little pocket parks and outdoor tot lots, being able to actually enjoy being near that river's edge and not worrying about uh, the condition on the edge, I think this was really successful for the project. I think of just on the outside, uh, a photo we don't have is there's a dam right next to this project. Yeah. The water roars over in the high when, when in the spring when the water is really running and it's really is a tremendous sight. So again, on interior, um, I don't want to take up too much more time. But, um, <laughs> interiors are wonderful. These are corridors. Again, what you get in um, rehab is because when you're given the opportunity, many buildings have it, you can put a little added space in your corridors so they're a little wider. All this kind of stuff helps management as well. B building the durability for management, people have plenty of room to move around, they're not scraping the walls. Um, this place looks as good year and a half plus years later as it did when we, when we just turned it over to management. So very delightful. Oops. Got over eager. So in protecting the historic character defining elements, you know, this is the fabric that's so unique to Arlington Point. Um, I'll start with these middle photos, the shutter doors. We had to keep these, uh, we have a number of these historic wood doors along the elevation that needed to be maintained for historic. But you know, these are people's homes. We need the light, we need the openness. How can we make this special? And I think the solution turned out really unique and special to Arlington Point that it's almost a couple of units that get this Juliet balcony sort of view um, into their units by keeping those historic shutter doors. And we have um, salvaged wood columns that are pretty unique to this building. Uh, they look like little donuts that kind of, they're gonna show up in the next slide. Same with the idea of these steel doors. Um, they're, they're special that if, they wouldn't be everywhere. You, they're inherently something to the building that we just have a respect for. So I think um, these are the pieces that really make this project stand out. So you can see, again, we, we came back to the lobby, those serendipitous moments where you see the steel doors hanging and giving some unique branding to the space. Um, this is in the kids' center. It's one of those infilled openings that really only happened just because of raising that floor level and now you have a, a child scaled chalk wall infilled in an existing opening. And then the really celebrated moment of the Van Brody Lounge with those views across the water. And uh, this is, I shouldn't take this away from Larry. I'd like him to kind of get that moment of celebration. <laughs> huh. Well, that's kind of you, but uh, <laughs> my, my rehabs, I love it when I'm given the opportunity, if I can think of a way for me to leave a mark. And I have a, I have a pretty good sized wood shop for my own hobbies and a good sized bandsaw. So um, came up with the idea of taking some of those wood columns and uh, slicing them up um, and then creating this. Well, in my brain, it was uh, an image of the river, which is uh, we're along the river's edge there. So I... Uh, that was kind of what I came up with and uh, it worked out pretty good. It works well. So yeah, preservation of a community anchor. We've, we've touched on it a number of times. These spaces are really only possible because of this being an existing building and not new construction. And Arlington Point was a community anchor in its industrial past and now it's stabilizing this community for the future, serving those vulnerable populations that really depend on their affordable housing opportunities. Uh, at the time of the ribbon cutting, I thought it was amazing. Former Mayor Rivera described being a kid growing up here and riding his bike around the vacant mill buildings. And he noted at the time that adapted mill buildings were actually contributing to over 500 units of affordable and desirable housing in Lawrence. So just that in itself is something to be recognized that now Arlington Point is housing 102 affordable units they're making projects like Arlington Point are making a huge investment to affordable housing stock in mass. And just considering the hundreds of thousands of square feet of vacant existing buildings that are just barely tapped right now as a resource to tackle the housing and environmental crisis we're facing. And now we're looking ahead to the neighboring property at 608 Broadway uh, that will add 87 units of affordable housing 
And there's so much that we're going to be able to learn from our residents at Arlington Point to better improve upon uh, the 608 project. Uh, one of the things that I just wanted to highlight is this complex relationship we keep talking about between historic preservation and green building concepts. And they just really don't always align. It's a little bit of a love-hate relationship, but I really think that preservation and resiliency need each other. Uh, something that we're exploring at 608, we're actually going to be pursuing enterprise green communities with the 608 project. And we're finding that this is an amazing opportunity. It really aligns with our existing buildings in that we really don't have to make huge dramatic changes to our building programs. Our sustainable, our existing buildings are just inherently sustainable and ticking off some of these requirements for EGC. And we're also finding that just implementing those responsible and sensible green strategies is taking care of the majority of the rest of the effort. And probably one of the greatest challenges as architects that we're seeing is the treatment of the envelope and what's responsible to the historic fabric, but what also is responsible for resiliency. Historic is often the driver for treatment of the envelope. So what are the conditions of the windows? Will they be rehabbed or replaced? What are the sight lines? What are the profiles? Then with those parameters, we actually get to select our energy strategy. In our case, the historic windows were in no shape uh, to be rehabbed, even if they all still existed. Uh, and so for that assembly that makes up literally half of this envelope, these replacement windows needed to be higher performing. The perimeter air sealing alone, which is no easy feat with an existing masonry opening, will already make a tremendous difference in occupant comfort. But this is going to continue to be a lesson that architects and designers and engineers are going to have to find the right solution to work through. And just a final point that buildings represent a ton of embodied carbon. Keeping and using existing buildings avoids the release of massive quantities of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so avoiding the amount of demo and replacing existing buildings, we've touched on this at the beginning, consider all the material that's already in place, all the structure that's in place, um, all of that embodied energy that we were able to avoid through production, transport, install, and the demo is all just underscoring that retrofitting existing buildings to meet high performance standards is just the most effective strategy. So, so that sign in the on the yeah. right is not is not accidental, Bethany. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I, like I didn't that. plan it there myself, but <laughs> <laughs> nice touch. Yeah. So I think um, I don't want to cut everybody else off. This is just um, love this view across the river. I think it really underscores kind of all of the goals that we're trying to hit and really preserving this as a community anchor. I um, noticed one of the chat comments to talk about parking and then it was kind of cut off, but I think she was asking about the masonry and insulation, et cetera. Um, Bethany, I think you hit on it. We had almost all our half windows uh, mm -hmm. that allowed you to do the equation, but also on the, math, on the historic guidelines, we're not insulating exterior walls like we used to and probably for a good thing. I know I've gone into, I think it was the uh, Fig Newton building in Cambridge that uh, we insulated, used to 25 years ago, stud and insulate all the interior walls. And uh, if that wa exterior wall leaks a little bit, it gets in just the moisture gets into those walls. And we had some areas of that um, the metal studs had almost fully deteriorated within about two and a half years. So I learned my lesson on that job that um, you got to be real careful insulating the exterior of old masonry walls. They were never really meant to be insulated. Right. And then we also added up one little thing as a bugaboo of mine is if I can, we put in our paddle fans up on the ceiling in these high spaces. And that helps just the air circulation, air movement, uh, level of comfort for the residents. Um, getting that warmer air back down to where the people are. It doesn't take much air movement to do that, but it, but it does seem to work. I know oh, we're taking up a lot of time. So. <laughs> oh, parking, parking was all part of the master plan. So that was all figured out uh, before, sort of before we got there, right, Dan? Yeah, we, um, 
the city, along with this 40 hour smart growth district, they have um, parking requirements that essentially ask for just a little bit more than one parking space per unit. It's based upon bedroom size. So one bedrooms is one space, two bedrooms is like one and a quarter and three bedrooms is like one and a half spaces. Um, but there was a, a building actually a, right next to Arlington Point that was a, an old storage building that a previous owner demolished. Um, the ceiling heights were not really um, tall enough to make it a, a reuse for residential. So that building was torn down and we had our parking lot. Most of the parking for Arlington Point is fits within that parking uh, within the footprint of that former building, along with some parking that we tucked in in front of Arlington Point. Thank you all for such a fabulous presentation. I think we want to leap right now into Somerville and uh, look at some of the historic buildings there. So take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Jean, and thank you, uh, everybody else, for uh, being part of this today. We'll try to speed it up as much as I can so we can have plenty of questions in the end. Um, but today you will hear the story of how an old water pump station became a historic building uh, with affordable senior housing, uh, becoming not only uh, a, a jewel for the city, but also will present to you the challenges, uh, the obstacles, the discoveries, as well as the result. My client is the Somerville Housing Authority, so I'll let Brian tell us about uh, the Somerville Housing Authority. Brian. If you're on mute, Brian, on mute. Yeah, so this um, this building we acquired about five years prior to purchase to uh, build you know developing it. Uh, we bought it from the MWRA, and um, you know with um, housing authorities we are always short on money, and, and we're always trying to add additional units to our portfolios. Um, some of right now is a really really hot um, community as far as any extra housing units, uh, really market rate units. Uh, so we were able to take advantage of purchasing this building for really nothing. And then um, over a five year period, developed a plan, put some funding in place and, and, um, and we hired Demel Schaefer to um, do a design and development. And they did a terrific job. We ended up with 25 beautiful units um, you know, this, this building sat uh, at the entrance of the city of Somerville uh, as you're entering from Arlington or from Medford. Um, it was a really blight um, to the community and that end of the city is, is really nice. It's on the Mystic River. Um, I actually grew up in that end of the city. Um, and so I would see this building always growing up and it was just covered with ivy and all sorts of um, you know, uh, growth that you really couldn't really tell really what it was, only that it was vacant and that um, it had great bones, beautiful arch windows. It had uh, you know, beautiful architectural details, slate roof. Um, it was a really, really nice building. It just needed some attention, we needed some love. And um, so that's where we turned it over to Frank and, um, and Frank um, worked his awesome. magic. and. Thank you. I'll let you move on, Frank. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. Um, just a little bit quickly about the Mel Schaefer. You know, today, uh, you know, uh, we are a firm of about, you know, diverse 70 people uh, here in the Boston area. <clears throat> Our work encompasses a variety of different things. Uh, we do everything from academic workplaces, senior living, multifamily housing, as well as science and technology. But here is, you know, the pump station as, as you, you know, we see it uh, today in a, in a larger campus setting. What you will see is that the entire complex here is part of the Summerville Housing Authority's campus. The historic building is right here. Uh, and this is the focus of what we uh, really were working on on the project when we moved forward. The interesting part about the building is 
that it started initially as a smaller component of a pump station. It was just a six bay <clears throat> building that uh, provided the functioning of the pump station. What is fascinating about the building itself is how it also grew over periods of time. The original piece was from 1862. Uh, there was an addition that was on in 1870 as well to the pump station. And then in 1895, another piece was added uh, to the building to complete it for that time period. And the architecture of the building is in a, um, you know, in a Romanesque uh, revival uh, architecture that was very popular at the time period for these types of um, architecture. Here in the back, you can begin to see the actually the boiler plant for the building uh, and the chimney stack, which actually no longer um, in existence. So we only have the shell at the beginning to really work with. Uh, the condition of how we really found this building is uh, interesting. It's um, the building was in very deteriorated condition. <clears throat> and it had uh, it served as a pump station up to 1912 when the pumps and engines were sold for scrap. And then during World War I, the building was renovated to offices and in 1921 for additional offices. But it has been basically dilapidated over, uh, you know, 70, 80 years, not being used for um, anything. <clears throat> you can begin to see as well that a lot of the detail had been lost in the building. Um, doors had been added where doors did not belong, and some of the, the windows in the mansard roof had disappeared uh, from the architecture. As Brian had mentioned, the planting has really had really overtaken the building. Uh, it was beginning to damage the architecture, beginning to damage the brick as well, which created an uh, incredible challenge as well during the renovation uh, of the project. One of the other fascinating things that uh, we discovered was that because the building was being used for storage, a lot of the original detail had been ripped apart to accommodate garage doors, very good looking garage doors, as you guys can see, so that it, it could function in a more modern utilitarian way. But uh, within that, the architecture of the building was being lost uh, throughout because of that <clears throat> bad treatment. Yeah, you can begin to see the deterioration of the brick. The sills had begun to deteriorate as well. And the brick was beginning to just uh, lose its, its, uh, its quality and it was beginning to fall apart uh, in, in multiple directions. We found some drawings as well of the original building through the archives. And one of the things that was one of the fascinating components of the building was the original um, heavy timber beams that existed throughout the complex. And this is what supported the Mansard roof, as well as some boiler rooms that had been buried that we discovered during construction. But in essence, this beautiful architecture existed there, but because of the nature of housing, it had to be covered. And actually the sad part is that the only people who get to see this uh, is the people doing maintenance in the equipment that is located in the roof. Uh, and those are the only people who get to really always enjoy that. We couldn't really make them part of the units because of fire and code reasons. Here you can begin to see some of the curvature of some of those beams on the inside and in the attic space, as well as the firewall separations that were created through the different divisions of the buildings that were added over time. The basement, one of the most interesting components of the building, you can see in the picture on the left, it's to me remnant of a scene from a Stanley Kubrick film, you know, to find this exercise bike in the middle of the space was a little uh, dark and disturbing when going down there. There were a lot of other issues that well that happened. The joke we had was that this is the building where animals came to commit suicide uh, just because we found multiple dead animals. The other interesting part, and. I don't know why we were all amazed by it, but we found water in the building, continuously flowing water. <laughs> and I don't know why we were all shocked. This was a water pump station and therefore water had to be in the building for some reason. And we realized that this was a challenge for us to deal with and to make uh, anything habitable at the basement or use it would be difficult because the water really 
was going through the building. So one of the things that we decided was to just basically forego the use of the basement and bury it and just use the first uh, floor and the additional mezzanine for more units as part of that space. We put all of our work together and we submitted for historic um, NPS approvals as every project does to get the historical tax credits and all of that good stuff. And we got rejected. <laughs> to our surprise, we were very shocked to get rejected. We didn't understand uh, why the project was being rejected. Upon further information, we found out really that the rejection had come because of the way that we had treated the windows. So originally, these were the original windows, and we were trying to make the argument that, yes, these are the original windows. This is a you know one and a half, two-story space that existed originally, but we're trying to create housing. In order to create housing, we really needed to create a subdivision of that window so that we can have a floor come through it, and this would be the apartment above, and this would be the apartment below. Uh, we had a revision. The interesting part, if anybody has ever gone through an NPS uh, appeal, is that you get one appeal and one appeal only. If you get rejected after that one appeal, you can't go back. So you get one shot to really prove your case. And in this case, we flew down to DC and try to resolve the issue. On the left, you can begin to see what we had presented. The entirety of that um, component of the window was about almost a foot if not uh, bigger. And that's one of the issues that they had. What we decided to do is begin to pull away from the window as much as possible. And then you can see on the right, how far away we pulled, they pulled away with the detail in order to minimize then the, the window mullion at that intersection, which came down to about eight inches in that revision. They approved us. They then said, yes, okay, go ahead. One of the advantages that we had is that the person who was reviewing us had his daughter who was studying at Tufts University. So he would drive through this building all the time. And he understood the nature of the building. He understood the need to renovate it. So it was, it was great to have that um, be part of it. Here you can begin to see during construction what that detail begins to look like and in order to support that slab and in order to stay away from the window uh, while we were doing construction. This is once we've demolished everything in the building, it was the first time probably that, you know, we were seeing the whole bay or the whole bay had been open, you know, probably since 1921. So we're beginning to see really the, the essence of the, the space as well as discovering a lot of these boiler rooms that existed down there that we didn't know that were there. And for some odd reason, uh, all of the borings had missed it and never landed on them. Uh, we also begin to see where we removed the firewalls and we had to add additional structure uh, beams at the top to support that as they were all three buildings combined into one. Here you can begin to see some of those windows and what they begin to look like towards the end when the renovation was done. The idea of looking at the windows is that they almost don't look like they're two windows, even though, as you can see, the operation of the double hunt, they are two windows serving two different spaces. Uh, and here you can begin to see further in the back where that floor is. And this is kind of like what the view from the inside is that you can experience. So it's really interesting experience and people like the, living in the second floor rather than living in the first floor because they get a different experience of it. But this is what it turned out to be. We decided to also leave brick exposed around the windows uh, to reveal some of the original uh, brick and also uh, aesthetic of that. <clears throat> this is what the building looks like today. We decided to take pictures in the winter time. We thought it was apropos to have snow and to have this kind of look for the building. I think it, it fit well with it. But now you can begin to see the fully renovated building has become iconic and really an entry point to the city of Somerville. It's become a home to 25 seniors and it's affordable housing. So a much, much needed component. Um, it is a loved building uh, by the, you know, the people who live there and the Somerville Housing Authority. Here you begin to see also as well some of the reconstruction of the detailing where the garage doors used to be and how we brought those components back. The windows again, there were some larger windows that also exist and some lucky units get to have those windows in their apartments. Uh, we decided to preserve one original window as well. And here you begin to see it. We reconstructed the window and that window is then put back at the end of the corridor. There's, uh, we pulled away the balcony so that you could get the full reading of that window 
as a remnant of what it used to be. And here's that window from the outside. You can begin to see it. We blocked in a lot of the doors that have been added. Uh, this building has won many awards. One of the best ones that we're proud of is the 2020 Mayor uh, Thomas Menino Legacy Award for it. Um, this is uh, the Mystic Waterworks Pump Station building uh, presentation. It's a building that we're very proud of uh, and we loved it. Um, I will uh, stop sharing now. And if there's questions, we are happy to begin to answer. Frank and Brian, I uh, I drive by, I live near there, your building, and I drive by it all the time. And every time I drive by, it makes me happy. I it was, <laughs> it was such a pleasure to see that building restored. Um, but because of the condition of it and what Frank just showed, I wonder if you could actually speak to um, the return on investment. And uh, because what we often hear is even with tax credit that uh, working on a building that's in that dilapidated a condition is going to be uh, more expensive than uh, a renovation. Do you track that or can, are you willing to share that? Ryan, it's your yeah. court. Yeah, honestly, um, that's not my forte. Um, I know this building does pay for itself. Um, any renovations there, any uh, maintenance does pay for itself. Um, I really don't know what the numbers are. They say I was on the construction end, so I really can't get into that point. We, we did receive about um, almost $2.5 million in historical tax credits mm -hmm. that went directly to that, which helped out a lot on this. We were capable of also as well through a VE process that every project goes to be able to do some cost savings in order to minimize also what we were spending and actually not using the basement and just filling it up and not trying to repair it actually helped out a lot in that uh, as well for that. It's also a fully electric um, building. There's no gas in the building and it uses all full electricity as well. Thank you. Uh, Dan, can you speak to the cost of, of that the kind of renovation work that you do versus new construction? Yeah, um, I'd be happy to, Gene. Um, you know, it's, uh, we obviously with, with adaptive reuse and historic projects, we get, the, we get the state and federal historic tax credits to help offset costs. Um, but maybe Larry, you can weigh in on this as well. But from my perspective, uh, as someone who, who's putting together financing on these projects, um, these adaptive reuse projects can be as expensive, if not sometimes even more expensive than new construction. Um, there's an efficiency to ground up construction um, that you, you can't always achieve with, with mill projects. Um, you know, you're obviously working with the confines of an existing box and you have to, you have to make trade-offs and, and sacrifices that which, you know, send, sometimes ends up with units. Um, like at Arlington Point, we have um, three bedroom units that are 1,100 square feet. You know, that's, that's bigger than, uh, or even 1,200 square feet. Those are bigger units than you, than you likely program if you were doing ground up construction. So um, there's not really a, a cost savings. I think there's a premium with this adaptive reuse, but the, the historic tax credits helps to offset um, offset that premium, if, if any. Um, Larry, I don't know if you want to chime in with your thoughts. Well, no, Dan, you, I, it's been a pleasure working with you because you seem to find out with your light, light tax, your 4%, 9%, things that I don't even know what they all are. Um, so budget-wise, uh, we are able to make it work. And as I was saying, with our continue, you know, you, you uh, think the process through. I always try to hold some things in abeyance to make sure we're not spending unexpected money um, until I know we have it available towards the end that we can put back into the project. Um, I, I, I don't want to say this out too loud, but um, there is also the cost of union versus open shop. And uh, when we're out in the mill areas and out, out in the suburbs, rural areas, it usually there's a good, when we're able to do open shop, that can really help the financing as well and i become more of a believer of um, all folks have the right to work you don't have to just be union all the time so um and we've actually 
the other thing we do is with our budgets, if we, we always open our bidding to open shop and union subcontractors, and sometimes we'll spend a little more money and allow the sub, uh, Abitha or whoever we're working with to sign up a couple of union trades. Um, we've done that on the electrical side, sometimes on drywall side or various um, parts of the carpentry side. So we, uh, we play that balance as well with the funds that are allowed. Hey, Dan, Dan, to answer your question, yes, we received the rejection letter before construction started. Uh, uh, and we were capable of, you know, tracking back fast, fast, fast and, and getting that before it got started. So, yes, we did that. But the interesting part, perhaps, to, uh, you know, Gene, to mention here is that the differences between the two uh, developers. I mean, the Summer Housing Authority is a not-for-profit, you know, uh, organization, which th th their, their board of directors basically is the people they provide housing to and the needs of the people that you know they're trying to do. So there's really the 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 need you know for them to provide housing is the important part. So I think that there's there's that component. Any profits you know go back to putting more housing into it because that's the production of of the housing authority to maintain enough housing for people. So I think that it would probably it would be interesting just to see ever a comparison of those two. You know the idea of you know there is you know develop developers who are for profit and they're not for profit and they're both doing the same type of work and in the end how do those costs really value out um, from a profit perspective and what that is but I would say that those are the benefits perhaps for the housing authority that they can really take the money and put it all into the developments um, you know the rents also are also set by you know you know the requirements they can't set their rents so did either your your project, Frank and Brian, was a few years ago, um, but I wondered if, in retrospect, uh, if either team has done an actual embodied carbon analysis of the project. Uh, your projects actually are very very similar to case studies uh, of a of a carbon study that the National Trust did about ten years ago. And one of the things that was interesting about that study was that uh, of all of the project types they looked at, uh, in many ways, the largest additional embodied carbon was in housing uh, because of the amount of materials that needed to be added into mill buildings and, and vacant uh, shells in order to uh, create housing. And so I was curious if you actually have any data about your investment in embodied carbon. And I guess I would ask the people listening if anybody needs a definition of embodied carbon, which is, uh, I'll go ahead and give it up instead of asking. Um, embodied carbon is, as Bethany pointed out, is the amount of emissions that are released because of new materials. And the great advantage of building reuse is that it avoids new materials. And so, so you are starting from a much lower bar in terms of emissions that need to uh, be paid off by reduction of operational energy. And most analysis shows that the amount of carbon from materials um, in an existing building, a renovation, is uh, actually offsets the operational carbon within easily five to 10 years. So from a time value of carbon, it is the single biggest thing we can do to drive our, our overall emissions down uh, in our building uh, stock, so, which is a huge part of it. So having, having hijacked the comment question period, did either of you do any embodied carbon or are you thinking about doing any embodied carbon analysis of the buildings. Yeah, we, we, we did not. Yeah, yeah, we did not, but interestingly enough, we had just got we have just gotten a software in the office uh, within the past month that uh, does exactly that. So we might actually run it and just figure out what it is because we have all the data. So it might be something that we do and we can share as well. But we didn't do it, but you, you are correct. I mean, aside from the high level of contaminations that you usually find in these sites, you know, that you have to clean up, you know, there, there are many advantages uh, to doing that, but uh, I would like to find out now. So you I will say that, um, so we have this really cool opportunity that I mentioned that, you know, we've got two buildings that are, 
very much similar, um, let's call it what it is, and they're right neighboring sites. And so since the 608 project is uh, pursuing enterprise green communities, we are actually now looking deeper into these kinds of factors. And so while we didn't out of the gate uh, do any sort of calculations on our completed Van Bur or Arlington Point project, um, we are starting to look at this uh, metric at 608 and we have a new energy model from our engineers that we're looking at to compare to the baseline. We did run the tally program in Revit on our uh, 608 project. And while we're still trying to get our arms around really like what, what does this mean? What, what are these numbers? It is really just eye-opening the, the amount of embodied carbon that would exist if you were providing that new steel structure or that new concrete floor plate or the masonry that you would never, it, it just wouldn't be feasible for a new construction project. It wouldn't be built that way at this time, but we are just seeing an incredible amount of embodied carbon that's just inherently, it's in place on site um, that we're saving because we're not demoing it, we're not rebuilding it. Tally is uh, becoming the software of choice. Mm -hmm. uh, which soon Frank might be what you've brought into your office, but it isn't, uh, it isn't like every tool. It has a bit to do with how it's used and how it's exactly. Used. But I would encourage you to bring your case studies to uh, the Carbon Leadership Forum uh, because the, for the sharing and, and cross-sharing uh, of, of, uh, of how your analysis is being done. I'd be very curious to see these two added to databases that we're trying to collect uh, for the comparison. Uh, I think there's a comment from Matt uh, that is that the speed, oh yes, the speed of approval is always a problem. and um, and, uh, and that, that actually ties back to thinking about the National Park Service. I've heard uh, teams say that they would rather not do uh, tax, historic tax credits because it jeopardizes the, the schedule and, and you can't get the approval until you put in part B, which is always, or part two or whatever, um, and that it's late in the, in the game. Uh, was that a conversation for either team about whether uh, the historic, what the, the hurdles of the historic tax credit process? I mean, I can't speak necessarily for the, the early conceptualization of it, but this is just something that from the design team perspective, we, we have a very solid understanding about working this into our design schedule. We understand, we work closely with our partners, our historic consultants about what it takes to get through the amendment process. Um, sometimes like the PV panels, adding that to the roof, that was an amendment during construction that we felt strongly about uh, bringing into the project. Um, I, I think it's just something, you know, it's time to have some very real conversations and get more of the uh, preservationists that are involved in MHC and NPS into the conversation about um, some of these more modern sustainability strategies and resilience strategies. I touched on the windows that those are often uh, a bugaboo as Larry likes to say, <laughs> but um, it's just, it, these are things, these are, um, these are ideas that really lean on each other, preservation and resiliency. And it's just, we need all of the stakeholders to come together and have real conversations about this. But I think it's something that if you have a design team and a construction team that understands that process and who they're working with, um, it doesn't need to slow the schedule per se. It's one of the reasons we're so pleased that the Boston Preservation Alliance is one of the affiliates and planners for this session. And ironically, many of the early tax credits back uh, projects back from the 70s, windows were not the stop. Uh, you know, if you look at, at Boston's old city hall, uh, the historic windows were replaced with plate glass windows and it, it was a tax credit project. It's only been in the last, uh, I would say, a decade that it feels as though windows have become something. I, I feel sometimes like I only get to talk about windows and bathrooms. <laughs> Uh, you know, that's the, I think that's true. That dominate our our conversations these days. <laughs> you, you, yeah, Gina, I would say that 
I would say that money is money. So it's very hard to say no to money if you can okay. get it right. Okay. So get, getting money from NPS and getting money from, you know, mass historic, I think it's key. I would say that for us, the challenge is always mass historic, not yeah. NPS. NPS is, you know, you know, you get it all in one shot, mass historic, you get up to right 20%. Right. So you got to keep showing, showing up and, and, and doing all of these things and you can cap it out quickly and, and they make you do a lot of work for it. So I would say NPS is really, for us, has never been really a, a problem. And I think if you understand, you know, the, you know, Secretary of Interior's requirements, you know, you pretty much can navigate that pretty well. But Mass Historic is always, you know, stronghold with strong personalities that, you know, need to be navigated delicately. And yeah, everybody gets stuck on windows. <laughs> I, I, I shouldn't interject that I've been doing this, I don't want to, don't express my age, but uh, well over the 30 years, 40 years. Uh, so my first jobs in 1978 and when I started was uh, historic rehabs. And windows were, I remember going to some sessions on windows pretty early in my career. So um, windows historically for National Park Service has always been one of the big factors. I'm only commenting that because it, it isn't just a new thing, but I think what helps us at Trinity and, and both our consultants and our, at least on my jobs, a general sense of what um, historic from experience will accept, won't accept. You know, like Frank, you talked about trying to get that window into, I mean, um, the floor in against those high windows. We ran into that out at JP, the old uh, school we did, gosh, that was early 90s or late 80s. Um, we had to do the same thing in the auditorium and uh, working with the park service on and they always like to pull pull those floor levels back, so you you're getting it as thin as possible at the windows and stuff. So, understanding those pains uh, before you get to them uh, also can help quicken the process. So, just just a comment. Is the is is the Lawrence project all electric? No, no. no. The, um, actually, they're water source heat pumps, and uh, but they're the. Uh, well, they're the bulldogs, so hopefully they're nicer. So on the on the heating side, they also they work a lot more like just a heat exchanger, like the old whaling units used to. You know, it's just you're you're pumping hotter water through the loop. And on the cooling side, we have a major cooling tower, and you're then cycling uh, eighty degree or seven eighty. I'm not sure seventy five degree water. Um, but on the heating side, we're circling about 120 degree water. So, so the heat system only has to work really through the summertime, which hopefully will extend the life of these heat pumps. Uh -huh. But that's gas fired. As we, as we try to increase the number of existing buildings being used, um, historic tax credits really actually historic buildings are a relatively small percentage of all existing building stock. Uh, would it be, would it be, if we were looking for the single most effective way in order to have more existing buildings used, would other kinds of tax credits be it? Would it be about money? Um, Dan, do you wanna, can I lob that one to you? Yeah, um, so just to summarize, Gene, I think that the question is um, what other incentives could um, interest developers in doing more adaptive reuse and historic re rehabilitation work? Well, or, or actually what I was wondering was what other incentives could uh, interest developers in reusing existing buildings which might not be historic um, or not, not have an historic designation? How mm -hmm. do we get more people to, how do we create a world in which reuse of a building is the first go to not the last and, and you know and they aren't as extraordinary as some of the buildings that you all yeah. have but a lot of that is kind of done at the local levels with um, now local historic boards can put a delay of demolition on a building relative for like a year's delay so the developer can rethink that process i see that quite a bit in the local papers up here in the beverly area and i've heard about that um, and Dan, everyone's indicated, I'm a believer of reusing old buildings and not just for the historic component. Heck, if you throw your heck tax credits in, it makes that renovation a little more difficult, doesn't it? Because they concern themselves with your floor coverings and your lightings and your windows and all that. But if you can just take the basic structure, 
Um, I think someone mentioned that a lot of times towns will assist you in the um, permitting process to, to make that go a little bit quicker. And, um, but what, and what about the non-historic buildings? What about the buildings that aren't over 50 years old? They reusing them is also about. good for the environment. It's, it's, you needed some, you know, it's, why people, why developers renovate historic buildings or buildings and get it approved for historic? Because there's that tax incentive, right? There is that money that exists there. And I think that that is a driver. I think that if there was an incentive uh, from uh, cities to reuse buildings of any type, I think that people would be um, happy to do that. But I think that to take a building and take the risk of, you know, uh, unforeseen conditions when you're working on it without any uh, potential of a pillow of money that exists out there, it's, it's a challenge for anyone to take that. So I think that if cities created incentives for developers to renovate just buildings and make use out of them and make them better, I think that it would be a change in people's minds to do that, definitely. Right, but cities do that with tax incentives on their own local levels. I, I've just seen it over the years that it's not always a tax structure, it is reusing old buildings. Um, and Frank, you're right about the unknowns and taking on that risk about unknowns, but uh, there, is, there is advantages out there to reusing older buildings and bringing them back to new life. I, you might even see it in the um, commercial side to some extent. I don't know if you'll see all these empty office buildings being converted. <laughs> Sorry, guys, that's a, that's a thing on COVID-19. <laughs> you know, what do we do with all these? You know, buildings? but if I, can, if I can go to all, if I can... Gee, right, if I can go to Alston and take one a two-story old warehouse and tear it down, right, and be able to put a 12-story residential building, you know, that I get approval for, you know, it's what am I going to do, right? You know, you know, which is I think that that's a conflicting component uh, of some of those things. Um, but I think it's a very interesting question. I, you know, I would I would look further into it, like Larry's, you know, saying that there's. Uh, incentives already in existence, you know, I think more and more I think are necessary. I wonder if there's a, because it seems to be a town by town issue, it would be, I guess I keep trying to think about what can be a national incentive, not unlike the National Historic uh, Tax Credit, uh, which is, is not every state has a state historic tax credit and very few states allow you to use the tax credits on a, an owner occupied building um, for, for residential. So it, 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 I wonder if as we look at infrastructure um, legislation, is, if we should be advocating for, for, for legislation that actually addresses a broader building uh, reused uh, credit that that is modeled after the historic tax credit to incentivize building reuse and if that would then have a domino effect to more local communities as we make the issue of embodied carbon clearer and just out of curiosity among the panelists when did do you remember when you first heard or began to understand the term of embodied carbon and what was what brought it to your focus or does everybody has everybody heard the term, and and what brought it to the, to your focus? I've heard the term. I continue to educate myself on it uh, on weekly, monthly, yearly basis. Um, but I think for me, it became when Somerville. I live in Somerville, uh, and I serve in the Urban Design Commission as well for the city of Somerville. And Somerville just went through a rezoning, changed their zoning to a new zoning. And I think that when they rechanged their zoning, they introduced as zero carbon and body carbon uh, components. For me, that was the first time that I was learning in more depth about it beyond just a buzzword that you hear. Mm -hmm. yeah. And ICON's been taking a very active role in being a sustainable leader in the industry. I, we signed on to the 2030 challenge some years ago. Um, we're increasingly trying to find new ways, new construction um, paths to um, evaluate our projects. And we're actually doing a lot of soul searching and going back through our completed projects and trying to um, study some of these metrics. And I, I think it's something, I don't know like what the, might've been the first point that I started recognizing these terms. And like Frank, I, it's a daily uh, re-education. <laughs> I, I don't know if I'll ever 
fully understand it and wrap my arms around it, but it's something that our firm just really takes personally and is committed to. So I think it's gonna be an ongoing process. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, are there other topics that you would like to turn to uh, in, for each other or questions for each other? You both do such amazing projects and have very deep portfolios. So I appreciate you sharing these two signature projects. Um, oh, thank you. This was a and, pleasure presenting. And Brian, I really appreciate someone who's a, uh, taking out of their, when you're a public official, taking time from your day to uh, give to the professional community. That's extremely generous. And uh, mm -hmm. same Larry and Dan to, to come to the Boston Society for Architecture to, to My pleasure. help us educate. And we, these will be, these sessions are recorded and they are shared. So the, the live audience is a very small part of who actually sees them, but, but is the group that gets the, their continuing education credits. We would also like to think as we, we uh, design new sessions for each as evolving education, how to bring in more partners. Uh, we'd like to bring in more developers and, and contractors to enhance the, have more of an integrated conversation about teams. So if there are organizations that you feel like we should be talking to or working with, uh, please share those with, with uh, Caitlin and, uh, or, or me or others at the BSA so that we can improve these sessions with every, every time we do them. And I wanted to thank you again. And uh, Caitlin, would you like to bring up the closing slide so I can thank uh, our sponsors again and our affiliates? Uh, because us, with these sessions, we couldn't do this without sponsorship. So we are extremely appreciative of Spalding Brick Company stepping up to the fore and sponsoring this series. Uh, it's been incredibly valuable and we really appreciate it. And we also appreciate our affiliates who have helped to broadcast it and will continue to broadcast it becomes more available to a wider and wider audience. Uh, the AIA chapters, uh, the Built Environment Plus, formerly USGBC chapter, and of course the IFMA chapter uh, have been, and Boston Preservation Alliance, who we mentioned. And we will continue to try and liaison with the preservation community to improve the process of building reuse. But as I say, it, it can't just be about historic buildings, as wonderful as your projects are. And I will continue to be happy every time I drive by your pump station, Brian. And uh, even happier now, <laughs> know more about it. And of course, in Lawrence as well. All right, thank you, thank you all very, very much. And, um, and have a great afternoon. Stay cool and sane and safe. And uh, we look forward to uh, having seen you in a future event. Take care, everybody. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thank you.